Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Dorfman Theatre here at the National uh, for tonight's platform discussion on Katie Mitchell's production of Cleansed. Um, let's start with a bit of context. Um, this is the first time that a Sarah Kane play has been on at the National Theatre, which is still a brilliant accolade for any British playwright, uh, and particularly, perhaps doubly so, uh, for one as radical and divisive as Sarah Kane. Um, it's her third play, the second apparently in a, uh, an intended trilogy that never came to pass. Uh, it was staged at the Royal Court for the first time in 1998 in a very overtly symbolic production by James MacDonald. Uh, and this, the third major production in this country, quite rare for a Sarah Kane play to only be staged three times in almost 20 years, uh, takes a very different tack. Katie's production is uh, doing something approaching realism, but I'll let her explain more about that perhaps. Um, Katie, let's start at the beginning. Hello. Mm, hello. Um, what drew you to Sarah's work and in particular to Cleansed as a play? Well, I think it's impossible to do, so that was immediately very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I think that there are lots of... Uh, every stage direction is impossible and it sets a very high bar. Both the violence and the sex are very um, demanding. So uh, that was very interesting. Th and then there's another formal problem in the material, which is that it's very episodic in its structure. It's 20 scenes. And so trying to find a way to cohere um, all those 20 scenes was uh, also a very tricky and interesting intellectual problem. So uh, there were those two things. And then, of course, the uh, beauty of the play. You know, it's a, it's a fantastically beautiful artefact, very, very uh, tender uh, piece of writing and from a feminist point of view it's got loads of stuff to investigate and explore which is always delightful most of the time one is tackling very sort of patriarchal material and trying to twist it into a feminist uh, production but here you had a sort of very strong feminist piece of writing to um, follow which was um, gorgeous mm. Dan mentioned that a while ago you'd said that it, you didn't really see it as a play or it's not really a play. Could you say a little bit more about that? Well, it does have characters, but they don't organise themselves or operate in a linear narrative way. So there isn't one male character who goes through over certain obstacles and emerges happy or sad. There's a, a, it's a very sort of jangly uh, group of characters that don't really obey the normal rules of a well-made play. Um, so that was very, yeah, that's very exciting. I, I'm not sure that I can do plays anymore. I find plays very tricky, <laughs> very, very tricky. I, I do more novels now, adapting novels, than I do plays. But yeah, so mm. it's just fragments that have to be sort of cohered and resist cohering. <laughs> and that's sort of like an impossible process. You're trying to cohere and then it's resisting. And it remains a very sort of strange um, balance of an attempt to cohere something that is incoherent. That's, I mean, something that's really interesting is on the page, they are very distinct scenes with distinct settings within the university. Um, and yet here we are, one location, one mise-en-scene, as it were. What was the approach to kind of get it to cohere? How do you go about doing that? Well, choosing one place automatically coheres um, a series of scenes that took place I think in five separate places and uh, that that was really the first thing that we chose to do I think with the material was put it in one place but that created a rash of unbelievable problems that I hadn't really thought through till we started to rehearse it because then we needed to move stuff on and off again and again 19 times and that became another sort of nightmare also because it's the Dorfman although they were very generous with the budget, uh, you probably couldn't deliver five exquisite slices of this university world. That, that, that would have been technically and financially a bit tricky. So the budget already sort of pointed us in the direction of one location. Those are always sort of hidden pragmatic things that are part of any decision-making process. And um, without giving too much away for anyone who's seen it, you also um, uh, take attack by having a particular character stick around the whole time, which gives it a, a quality. Um, Dan says he felt that it was almost as if it were happening like a dream. For me, it seemed kind of 
more slippery than that, that it was dreamlike, but still somehow definite. Um, what was the decision to try and uh, draw that element out? Well, again, it was, it was to cohere the 20 scenes. So we decided, and, uh, and it's, it could be taken either way, that it was the dream of one character, which is Grace, who's a character who's lost her brother. For, he died of a heroin overdose, and she has this amazing dream. And uh, so we just put her there at the centre. And then when we worked on it, we thought it was more useful to work on it as a genre of surrealism than naturalism. Because then we could have lots of illogical things happening, um, which would, well, a lot of illogical things happen in the play, let alone all the bits of illogic that we added. Um, but doing it as surrealism meant that the actors could be happily inside the, a dream landscape committing to what they were doing, as opposed to going, but this doesn't add up, why is my character doing this and not that? And asking all of those questions that normally you ask when you're in a realistic genre. You're famous for the detail of your research uh, a lot of the time. And yet, as you say, this, this play happens in a kind of non-space at some level. How do you go about beginning to ask those same questions that you might of a play with a very definite setting for a play like this? Yes, I, I used to do a lot of research. I don't really do very much now, <laughs> to be honest. I do too much work. I have to sort of I have to deliver much faster, much quicker, be much defter. I can't go to Norway any longer and do long <laughs> research trips, looking at the lights <laughs> tragically, or recording the birds like I used to do when I was about 25. <laughs> so I, I've stopped doing that. Um, but for this, I had two very critical conversations actually before I uh, embarked on it. One was with Dan because he knew Sarah and he studied her work for a long, long time. So I had a long chat with him about the material. And the sec second was with Vicky Featherstone, um, who again really knew Sarah very well. And so I wanted to test uh, my initial ideas that were to do one location and make it the dream of one character. So I test run my concept. That was my research, very superficial. And then we did a lot of research into machinery. Mm. <laughs> So I don't want to sort of give away, for those who haven't seen any of the show. Um, but yes, no, I don't think it was any... And we, we went back all, all over that material from the Bosnian War. I think for my generation, uh, that war was such a defining and sort of horrendous, devastating event. Um, and it, it, was, you know, it was painful to revisit the descriptions of what happened in camps like Srebrenica and to, to watch wonderful documentaries that were made during the time. There's one called The Valley, which is one of the best documentaries that was made about the Bosnian War. So we spent a, a lot of time looking at that material and reminding ourselves of that historical period. But I'd say if you were to scrutinise the research, it was flimsy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, James MacDonald uh, spoke about that when I interviewed him recently, this sense that Sarah was the only playwright at the time who was really looking at that situation and saying we must examine this mm. on the stage. Um, today the, the play feels political but perhaps in a very different way. Um, how did you read it in terms of the contemporary world in 2016? Well there's still lots of wars going on aren't there? Yeah, Syria uh, and many other places. So I, I think we try to make less specific the Bosnian reference and just sort of insist at a quiet sort of low level way using sound predominantly on the fact that the, this little world where you were watching these strange events existed in a bigger context of violence. So in the background there's always a sense that there could be a war situation just smashing into the room that never quite did. So we just wanted to honour that part of the play, um, but not make it specific to uh, the Bosnian War. Mm. But we did it through sound, mainly, yeah. Could you say a little bit more about the sound design? Because it's something that a lot of people have, have taken to very, very keenly. <clears throat> a tremendous work. Uh, two, two artists made that. Melanie Wilson was the sound designer, and Paul Clark was the composer. And uh, the whole evening is through composed and through designed. And um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And actually, when we were, we made the, they made the uh, sound as we re were rehearsing it. So it's a very tight weave between the action and the sound and the music. Um, very, but very, very fine, mm. delicate work. And also a very important colleague, which is Mike up there, bless him, had to um, operate it. 
and mix it live and do a lot of very complicated things. And then uh, the show is radio mic'd as well, so that we could have this very strong soundscape and yet still hear the text. Mm. Um, obviously, it's very violent and explicit play. How do you go about approaching that as both material and as something to put on stage? Literally. <laughs> I approached it literally. And together with um, uh, both the performers, the makeup and wig department, the armoury department, the props department. So it was a very busy rehearsal room with a lot of plastic sheeting. Um, we worked out how to do it, you know, and it was really mechanical and technical. Um, and I felt it would be very good that it would be like life. So it would be really offensive to watch. In the same way that you, when you have, um, what's that thing where they do an implant? They haven't had an implant when you go to the dentist and you have to sign a piece of paper and you think, why am I signing a piece of paper? And then 10 minutes later, there's this big dentist's fist pulling out your tooth and he's, you know, oh, really? It's, we wanted to make it as horrible as that, mm. really. Um, <laughs> it's an homage to the man who did my tooth pulling out. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, of course it isn't. Seriously. We just thought it would be, it, it would be m more useful to relate it to those sorts of things that happen in life, where you, we can use sound, for example, to carry the violence um, much more than anything else. But uh, it was very complicated to pull off that violence. So I was very afraid that people would giggle. I didn't think they would faint. That was like, that was completely the last thing I was expecting was success. Mm -hmm. That the violence would be successful enough to be faintable to. That's, I wasn't expecting that at all, no. And then that's very upsetting because I, you never want to cause anyone any harm, do you? I mean, that's awful. The, the people who fainted, one, one wouldn't want that to happen. One isn't aiming for that. Sure. With the decision, I mean, the, the stage directions are surreal. They're almost impossible. In fact, some of them are, are very directly impossible. They're challenges yeah. to a director to kind of find a, a non-natural, a, a non-literal language. And yet you come at it from the other way and go, well, actually, how can we deliver this as if it is genuinely happening? Mm. What was the, uh, the reasoning behind that choice? I think that's, that's maybe it's just how I understand the material. When I read it, a bit of literature, I see, I see pictures of it as if it were like fragments of a film. I imagine immediately someone having their tongue cut out or I imagine immediately someone having their uh, hands chopped off. And I don't, I don't think, oh, there's a nice ribbon there coming off a wrist mm -hmm. in a symbolic way. That, I, I don't think that's quite what the stage direction makes you think. It makes you go, fucking hell, blimey, it's only scene four. <laughs> Yo, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I want to read the play, actually not sure I want to direct it. It's quite hardcore. So I tried to honour the um, initial sensations and images I had when I first read the material, which is, I think is part of the impact that it, the writing has. I tried to translate that into something concrete on stage. But there's lots of things we failed at. Mm. We couldn't do the rats. We spent hours, an endless conversation about rats. Should we have real rats? No, the Germans tried real rats. They were dreadful. They're too shy. Um, <laughs> And then, and then the first production tried socks through holes, so we tried socks through holes. No, that didn't work, it was too comedic. And then finally we came up with the rat. The homage to the stage direction is the rat shooting that happens. That was the best that we could offer up. So we failed on a lot of them. There's supposed to be a white light thing that we failed on. There's a whole catalogue. Towards the end, I remember sitting there with everyone going, oh, how are we going to do? No. Anyone think of how we could do this? Nope. Why not? So we just crossed them out. Mm. There we are. But we tried to do nearly everything. And we, we risk, you know, it's very risky to do sprouting flora and fauna. It's very risky to do that gracefully. It just risks, you know. Mm. Um, graceful is a, an interesting word. It takes us to the, the beauty in the play, this sense of love that runs through it, mm. all this sort of, uh, uh, this, I don't know what it is even. I, I was about to use that very tacky image of like a s words through rock, but that mm. kind of feels trite. Um, what is the kind of flip side to that violence within the play for you? What makes it a beautiful piece? Well, as soon as you do something violent uh, in one scene, and then you see someone take their clothes off in the next, the vulnerability of the naked body 
in the context of possible violence is that's just so cunningly constructed by the writer you know if if someone just came on and took their clothes off in a show that wasn't before tongues had come out then it would be one thing but after there is that potential violence and then you see a naked woman standing there you go oh, be careful be careful and you and she reminds you do you see of the fragility and the vulnerability of just the human body and it makes you think why would you ever want to damage that in any way so beautiful so complex and uh, so I think I think that's the brilliance in the writing violence 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 and then people standing there naked or a young man standing there covering his genitals and you feel just the fragility of the human uh, being and then if you do more violence and then you do tenderness and then you do love making it has the same sort of effect so it's sort of the violence for me intensifies the tender humane part of the material mm. I think without the violence it may it may be a bit I don't know just maybe not quite work as brilliantly so it really draws attention and it's a huge relief when you see oh we're away from that violence for a bit and you see you know someone naked or someone making love it's a bit of a relief although you do think someone's going to cut something off any minute now mm. um, oh, you do feel that so I think that's just very good craft you know really cunning craft we well, make it sound I mean the way you've described that it's that sense of everything containing its own opposite I suppose which seems to run through the play I mean behind these <coughs> trees that are bursting out of a, a very indoor space um the reality of bodies versus the kind of fakery of of the violence the male female mm. thing that's running through the play in terms of bodies and mm. uh, and surgery um could you say a little bit about doubling in the way the play oh, i think you've just said it really brilliantly i don't think i could better it <laughs> um i just think it's very the play is very complicated it's more like a it's more like a sort of musical structure than it is um a play mm. so it sets up with an early theme and then it sort of you know does variations on it so one of the themes is um two gay men are talking about d d have a slight disagreement about what love is one says that love only exists in the moment. To be really authentic and proper can only be now that the feeling exists. And the other says, no, I, will, I believe in, I'm going to futurize love. And I say that I can commit to you forever. This big, and so this, this scene repeats itself, there are different variations on the same scene. Um, and then that parallels other things that are going on. I mean, the complexity of the writing, is just beggar's belief. I mean, it's so mm. subtle, so complex. Um, so brave, really amazingly brave bit of writing. But yes, it has lots of doubles and references. And the production amplifies that. Mm. So when we have the woman who dances in the peep show booth, because we've got the dreamer there, you can see pornography, a woman doing pornography, and then another woman, totally naked, looking at it, going, why would you do that? And then you have a wonderful conversation between the two realities, if you like. You said at the start that, uh, that you were drawn to the play because of its feminism. What, what do you feel its feminism is? What's its, uh, what's its drive on that front? Well, that's, you could rotate that question in many ways, couldn't you? Um, I was reading a book called Men Explain Things to Me. Have you read that by Rebecca Solnit? No, I haven't. It's very good. The second essay. The first one explains men explain things to me. It's very funny. It's worth reading. Um, the second um, talks about violence. And um, she proposes that violence is a gendered activity and she bases that upon her study of the amount of the inmates in prisons and the inmates in prisons 96 or 5 percent are male so uh, she she has this theory that it's men who do violence and um, it's, it's quite a, it's, it's well argument it argued it's very compelling and and I wonder whether there isn't something useful in terms of understanding Keynes writing which is if that is the case if it is a gendered activity and you're a feminist then you're going to portray it very particularly because you're going to portray it as you somehow really want people to understand and experience it which is not nice so I think there's something there's something about the violence that's really shocking and maybe, I uh, posit it, it may be not right, I, I began to think it could only be a woman who could frame it like that because she's framing an activity that she doesn't understand. I mean, 
lots of men, of course, would wouldn't understand violence. I'm I'm not saying that, but um, that they uh, that men can't be feminists and pacifists and, and all of that. But just generally, it it, sen- it tends to be done by more men. That's it. So maybe the feminist rage at that mm. is um, is why the violence is so intense. And as the last question from me, then you you have this other pair by bringing grace onto the stage throughout you have tinker and you have mm. grace how do you see the two of them working together and reflecting each other one for love one for <laughs> violence um well i could i mean minute by minute you're asking yourself a question about um both of them and their relationship and which one represents or wants whatever compared to the other but I think the, the thing that is breathtaking about the architecture of the play is the penultimate scene is the most unexpected scene imaginable where it shows the perpetrator making love to someone. And that's like, <laughs> it's just so unexpected. And so the play never settles with very easy positions. You know, you may think that Tinker is a character who represents and uh, you know, supports violence and that Grace doesn't, but actually it sort of swaps around a lot. It sort of shifts a lot. So it, it isn't neat, mm. sadly. Nothing's neat in this play. That gives us, as audience members, a lot to look forward to. So thank you very much, Katie Mitchell. Thank you.